successfully deliver projects into the future. So I've got a few housekeeping items that I need to go over before we get started. Uh, this webinar is scheduled for two hours today, so this includes time for the presentation and we should have ample time at the end for question and answers. As Charlotte mentioned, we are recording today's webinar and we'll place the recording in mo.u for future reference. This webinar will also be added to the course catalog of the program delivery training program. All lines are muted during the presentation. The Q&A function will be open, so I encourage you to place any questions you have in the question and answer uh, pod that's uh, on the bottom of your screen. We will be monitoring these questions during the presentation to determine if we should break into the presentation for clarification. We may also type in an answer in the question and answer, but we will uh, address all the questions at the end so that they are on the recording as well. We will break after the pres presentation and address questions from the uh, chat pod. The presenters will also be taking additional questions at this time. So for today's webinar, I'm going to introduce the speakers that we have. So we have David Koenig, and I represent the bridge management section. He is our bridge management engineer and is responsible for bridge inspection, bridge inventory, and load rating. Travis Stump is our um, structural hydraulics and preliminary design engineer. He manages our preliminary design staff and deals with hydraulic legal issues facing the department. David Hagemeyer is our structural resource manager, and he's in charge of our plans production section, as well as general recruiting of engineers and technicians in our office. And Trent Crawford is a senior structural engineer in our review section, and he's uh, Dan Smith's uh, kind of right-hand guy. And then I'll briefly talk about our fabrication section led by Dean Frankie and our development section led by Darren Kim Kimna. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to David Koenig and let him take over. Thank you, Brian. As Brian mentioned, I'm David Koenig, bridge management engineer, and I'm in charge of the bridge management section. So if you think about how our division structured, where we've got ADA FTEs when we're at full staff. So most of you are used to dealing with the people that are doing design work for STIP projects and stuff like that on bridges. So that's about 65% of our workforce. So the other 35% is kind of more what we would call an operations side, probably is a better characterization. So that's kind of what the people in the bridge management section are kind of more into operations type things. So um, if you go to the first slide, Brian. So we kind of do a, a wide variety of stuff. Sometimes I think if they, they can't find a place to put it, they give it to me. So, um, so I'm gonna kind of jump around to several different topics that kind of covers the broad basis of what we do. So a big thing that we're involved with is we work directly with motor carrier services on the issuance of overweight permits. And there's, there's two classes of those permits. The first class is a routine permit. And uh, they're kind of classified in terms of gross weight from our perspective. So anything that's over 80,000 pounds, which that's the normal legal weight, um, up to 160,000 pounds is a routine overweight permit. So a common truck that you see that's, that's hauling that kind of weight is going to be seven or eight axles. So um, based on stuff that motor carriers gave me, they issued close to 72,000 permits uh, for that. And that was from 2020 data. So they have a uh, software motor carrier services and what that software does, it's a Bentley product. It routes the load and will auto issue a permit. So part of that process, they need to make sure that any bridges that are crossed are safe for that load to move across. So basically they they pick the route, they find the bridges on it and they screen those bridges for acceptable capacity using that computer program. So the way it's done is we provide structural data sets to, uh, to motor carriers and we go through a process twice a year where we update those data sets. So that's like a structural model of a bridge. The truck gets run across it to analyze it and if it's okay, they issue the permit. If not, they uh, find a different route. So we also uh, have uh, truck capacity information for comparable trucks that's stored in TMS. So sometimes on weird bridges and stuff, we may not really have a, a structural model on our normal rating program. 
So we got a means for putting in some values and stuff in TMS and they use those values to determine whether the permit's good or not. So basically what we do is a uh, bridge management section, we update TMS data daily. There's always somebody updating the data or something in the system. And then we work with motor carrier services on those data updates twice a year. So next slide. So the other class of overweight permits that we work on is what's called a super load permit. So basically that's essentially anything that has a gross weight above 160,000 pounds. So a common example of that, uh, you've probably seen locally the, the 13 axle rig that uh, Twee House uses to move scrapers, dozers, things like that around. So when you see that truck, that thing's gonna be running somewhere around 250,000 pounds, probably, probably actually a little heavier than that. Um, so that's kind of the common one that we do. We do five to 10 per year that are greater than 300,000 pounds. So like if General Motors was updating a, a plant where they make vehicles, or if you've got a power plant that's upgrading or being built, those type of things, when they happen, there's huge loads that need to be moved into those. Uh, the nuclear plant's another good example. We're always moving stuff over there. So the largest one that we've ever moved uh, was some stuff that went to the nuclear plant and that was probably 10 years ago, maybe. And those were just a little bit over a million pounds. They actually came from overseas from France and they barged them up the river and took them off the river and moved them from there over to the plant. So there's two photos down below. I think the one on the left was actually something that went to the nuclear plant. And the one on the red one is basically a transformer. So though both of those loads were roughly 780,000 pounds. So that gives you some idea what that type of vehicle looks like. You see one of them, get out of the way, essentially. Next slide. So last year in 2020, some of you probably are aware that there was a lot of wind farm construction that went on around the state. There was one up around Kirksville, one over in the Northwest, and I think two down uh, in the Southwest district that were being built at the same time. So that caused a huge surge in superload studies. So each one of those turbines that goes up is probably going to be four or five superload permits and a whole bunch of routine permits. So last year we completed almost 3,700 studies. Um, in July we did 443. So um, we have up to four people that may work on these studies. A lot of times one person can handle the volume, but sometimes we got all four people working on them. So even with the surge last year, um, we still almost all the time, 99.9% .9 of the time, we complete those analysis within two working days and get a response back to motor carrier services. So as I've kind of alluded, we work very closely with them on these moves because these moves, especially those, those two pictures I showed you, they're very difficult to get to the site, you know, not just because of bridge issues, but because of curves are too sharp or a hill's too steep or something like that. There's all kinds of things that go on when we do these moves. So there's a lot of district people involved in these moves. Some of you may be some of those ones that are involved. So it's very difficult to, to route a, a five or 600,000 pound load. So that graph down there, it kind of shows you, go back one, kind of shows you what, um, since 2016, what the what the volume has done. So we did 2177 in 2016, and we did almost 3700 in 2020. And for this year, we're still running high. Um, I don't think we'll end up at 3700, but we'll probably definitely end up over 3000. So next slide. So another thing that we work with is we work on the LPA program. So the basically, this is the local public agencies when they use federal funds to do bridge replacements or bridge rehabs. So there's kind of two areas of, of money that's used there. There's the BRO program, that's basically bridge replacement off system. And so that's available for local agencies to replace what are called off system bridges using federal funds. And off system is determined based on the functional class of the roadway. Then STBG, I think that stands for state block grant program is available to replace off system and on system bridges. And so that money primarily is focused in the three transportation management areas. So that's um, St. Louis's East West Gateway. Then you have Mark in Kansas City and um, Odo in Southwest District. So 
basically what bridge division does um, or what MoDOT does essentially we we provide oversight of those projects the local agency hires a consultant you know does all the bidding and stuff like that but we have to provide oversight since federal funds are used so each district they have an LPA team uh, they're the ones that work more directly with the local agency doing the projects. Uh, design division is deeply involved in this. Julie Sotomayor leads that effort. So they provide the statewide oversight. They provide guidance and general policy to ensure that we're complying with all the requirements of the program. Um, the requirements are basically similar to what we have to do on our projects. Uh, design division also maintains the EPG section 136, which deals with the local public agency program. So, next slide. So, as I said, we're deeply involved in this program. Um, we do work with design division anytime there is maintenance or updates of EPG 136 needed, or if there's changes in policies on bridge projects and stuff. And we're actually to the point where we kind of need to do a major update. I think the last update was back when Kenny was still managing that area. Um, another thing we do is we develop a yearly list of local bridges that are eligible for federal funding with these programs. So bridge has to be meet certain criteria to be eligible to spend funds on it. The same thing we have for MoDOT projects. And then we also develop uh, a yearly funding distribution percentage, and that's used to determine the allocations to counties for the BRO program. So that's calculated based on MBI data and stuff. Um, we've got a couple people in the area that do what's a ps &E review of the bridge projects uh, for compliance for program requirements. So it's kind of a a cursory review, it's not a very you know, in-depth review. We just don't have the resources to do that, but we're basically, when the project is finished, plans are done, they get submitted, we review it. If we got any questions, we get back with the consultant or the district with those questions and they work to address those and then eventually gets approved for letting. So another thing we do is a, a local can basically build a, a project themselves with their own funds. And, and this is for all system bridges only. And if they do that, they can submit it and they have to meet certain criteria. And they can basically get credit for that through what we call a soft match credit program. It's, it's kind of similar to on the MoDOT side when people talk about events construction credits, it's kind of a, a same type of concept. Um, we also, people have probably heard of the BEAT program. Um, there's a companion program on the traffic side called TEEP. Um, so we, it's bridge engineering assistance program. So basically uh, that's funded right now at $150,000 a year and we manage that. So it's there to provide some engineering assistance to a local agency on bridge problems. So if they on inspection, we find a girder that's badly damaged or something and they need some guidance on how to repair it. That's what the beat project is used for just a little small. They're, they're usually run about $4,000 for a project. So there's not a lot of engineering going on. Just some very basic, hey, do this and that'll get it back to 10 tons or 20 tons, whatever it may be. Next slide. So uh, another big thing that we do is the national bridge inventory. So basically we're required by federal law to maintain a national bridge inventory. So, so what is that? So basically there's 100 plus items that we have to track on bridges that are part of the national bridge inventory. And there's also other items that we, we track just for our own internal use and stuff. So it's all required by federal regulation. And so we have to submit data on all the bridges in the state to FHWA each year. And so a bridge basically is anything that's greater than 20 feet and it has to be on a public waterway or a public highway, sorry. Uh, so it includes MoDOT bridges and local agency bridges. So there's roughly about 10,400 MoDOT bridges based on last year's submittal. And there's 14,160 local agency structures. So there's actually more bridges on the, on the local agency system than there is the MoDOT system. So there's a coding guide, the NBI coding guide that's, that's uh, put out by Federal Highway. So that basically defines what all the items are that need to be submitted and what the criteria for, for coding those items is. Uh, so all this data is stored in the bridge part of TMS. Some of you may have been in there. So it's got all the MBI data and then the other data that we track, track in there as well. Um, so a lot of that data ends up being used for uh, tracker measures. Um, um, there's two bridge tracker measures in the, in the statewide tracker and then we have some in our division tracker as well. 
It's also used by the districts for asset management. Uh, it's used for STIP programming and other stuff. So, next slide. So a big part of what we do is the bridge inspection program. So I've got roughly 30 people in my area and half those people are directly involved in the bridge inspection program. So federal law requires that a bridge has to be inspected periodically. Um, a general inspection basically is done every, every two years. Um, so all those requirements are defined in uh, the national bridge inspection standards, which are part of federal regulations. So we call that NBIS. So bridge division's role, so we basically set policy, we provide guidance for the bridge inspections. Um, we monitor and make sure they're getting these things done on time. You know, they're due every 24 months, so you gotta do them on the interval. You can't wait for six months to do it. It's gotta be done on that at the interval because that's set in federal law. Uh, we ensure that they're being done properly and make sure they comply with any MODOT policy requirements we have as well as federal requirements. We also have to make sure that our inspectors around the state meet requirements to be doing bridge inspections. So to become a bridge inspector, you have to meet certain education and or experience requirements, but you also have to take a two week NHI class and successfully complete that. And then there's some refresher classes you have to take every five years. So there's, there's a lot involved to get qualified to be an inspector. So part of my role is to, to make sure we're getting these classes scheduled and you know, monitor who needs what track that and get the classes scheduled as, as they're needed. Um, also manage some hourly rate contracts that are used for inspections that are done by consultants. Um, we got, we do fracture critical inspections and stuff on the local system, a small number of them. And then we do some underwater inspections by contract uh, on the MoDOT and the local system. And we also work with Federal Highway. Um, each year they do a review of our program to see if we're following the rules essentially. Um, so, after that's done, they'll towards the end of the year, they'll give us here's a report. Here's where you're doing good. Here's where you're doing. Okay. Here's where you need some major, some major effort. So then there's, um, we perform more specialized inspections that are needed as well. So just beyond a general inspection. So next slide. So there's kind of 4 primary types of inspections that are done on bridges. So there's the general. That's what I've already alluded to. That's a 24 month frequency. Fracture critical, so a bridge that's fracture critical, it's got members on it that if they failed, you could either have a total collapse or a partial collapse of a bridge. So they get extra special attention. It's more of a, a close up hands on type of inspection. Those are also done on a 24 month frequency. So as an example, the two Missouri River bridges out here, they're considered fracture critical. Then a special inspection, that's kind of a broad category. There's a lot of things that get thrown into that. Um, some of them are submitted on the MBI, some of them aren't, and they can have a frequency anywhere up to 60 months. So it's something that you need to check. Good example would be we got bridges that have pins and stuff in them that are part of holding the bridge together, and we'll use ultrasound to check for cracks and things like that in those pins. Then underwater, um, from an MBI standpoint, they only consider it to be an underwater inspection if it requires like diving type stuff, equipment. Um, we essentially do an underwater inspection on any bridge over a waterway, but there's only about 250 that are submitted on the MBI. And those can be done up to a 60 month frequency. So if you got a bridge where it's pretty routine, there's not much going on, you'll probably be doing those at 60 months, but we got some that we do 24 month frequency. So MoDOT does inspections. We also have um, four local agencies that do inspections, and then we have consultants that do inspections. So the local agencies, uh, Greene County, Missouri does inspections, St. Louis County does, St. Louis City does, and Kansas City does inspections. So out of those four areas, that's roughly about 800 bridges that are done by local agencies. So the balance uh, is roughly 13,350 is done by MoDOT people in the districts. So when you look at the MoDOT uh, own bridges uh, for general inspections, um, Bridge Division has three snooper crews, and that's what you're seeing in that picture there. That's one of the snooper trucks. They get those big things. Those those trucks cost around eight hundred thousand dollars. So very expensive, and you need to know what you're doing. You're operating them so you don't damage them. So that's roughly about six hundred and fifty bridges that are done statewide. Uh, we got three crews that do that. They, they're basically on the road 24 seven. 
and they take care of those 650 bridges. So the balance of those bridges are done by the district. So each district's got a district bridge engineer and they may have one or more additional people that work and help them with inspections. Next slide. So the super crews, uh, you know, snooper actually is a proprietary term, so they don't like us to use that. So we use UBI crew a lot. So it's under bridge inspection crew to do major structures and anything that requires special access equipment. So when I talked about the special inspections where we're using a UT gauge to check a pin, that's something that our, that our crews do because those uh, UT things, they're, I think we can get them for about 5,000 now, so they're not cheap and that's not something you're going to buy and give to every inspector around the state. Um, we also have a dive team. Um, basically, they primarily they do underwater inspections that are classified as deep wades, and then they do some dive inspections. Now, we, we restrict our people to depths less than 60 feet. And basically what that does when you're diving, if you know much about it, if you go too deep, then you have to come up slowly and stuff because of nitrogen levels and stuff in your blood. So 60 feet is the depth that we can go and we don't have to worry about that aspect of it. So anything that's that's got over 60 foot of water or if it's got dangerous type things going on, we have some structures that are just very, you know, dicey to get in there to do it for our crews. So we put those out to consultants. So basically they do a lot of dives. They do the Missouri and Mississippi rivers. Um, those got such high current, it's difficult to, to do anything in those rivers. And then the lake structures where there's greater than 60 feet. So our deepest, um, our deepest water is down. I think it's Kimberling city. It's the far south, one of the far south bridges on the lakes. And it's at normal pool, it's got 165 feet of water. So that's when we give out to consultant. So there's a couple of photos there, the one on the left. Uh, go back. Um, that's basically one of our guys. You can kind of barely see him down there to the left. It's actually human. It's not some aquatic creature. So he's doing basically probing the footing around that column, checking to see if it's exposed or anything. And then there on the right, that's something that come from the consultant. They'll do um, basically what's called acoustic imaging. That'll it's kind of like sonar. They'll ping that pier, drive around it, ping it, and then they kind of draw a picture of what it looks like underground. So that that's a good example of what that looks like. So next slide. Then believe it or not, we have a tunnel inspection program as well. So uh, one of the things I have to do as part of my job is I have to maintain credentials on bridge inspection and tunnel inspection. So tunnel inspection is a one week course that you have to take and then you have to do refreshers every five years. So I've got to have all that qualifications for the one tunnel that we have, which we don't own. That's the uh, St. Louis city actually owns the tunnel. It's basically where US 67 goes, goes under the west runway of Lambert Airport, in St. Louis. So tunnels, they have to be looked at every two years. Um, they're very complex systems to inspect and maintain. Um, the tunnel at, at St. Louis, actually, it's fairly simple compared to some of the ones on the east coast that go under a bay or something like that. But it's still a very complicated system. So St. Louis City, they hire a consultant to do that inspection. And it's actually due for inspection this year. I think it's going to happen in October is what we're hearing now. So, so basically MoDOT's required to maintain the inventory data on tunnels. And then we work very closely with St. Louis city to ensure that they're complying with the requirements that in federal laws related to uh, tunnel inspection. So next slide. Another big thing we do that the districts ought to be familiar with, uh, we do low posting evaluations. So couple example of posting signs down there at the bottom of the slide. So basically this gets back to MBI data and federal law. You're required to do a low capacity evaluation on any bridge that's on the MBI. So we do these for the MoDOT structures and we also do these for local agency structures. So what are you doing when you do that? You're basically, you've got mod a truck that models a a certain legal load around the state. So like a, you know, some type of a single unit vehicle, which is like a dump truck or a concrete truck. And then you'll have like semi trucks. So you've got a model that's representative of those type of vehicles and you run that on the bridge and analyze it. And then you look at the results and you determine if you need a load posting on the bridge. So if once you do that, when you, if you get a result that's 
less than what the legal gross weight is for a single unit or a semi vehicle, then we have to put a load posting sign up. So currently there's roughly on the MoDOT side, there's a, roughly a thousand that have, that have some type of a load restriction on them. And then there's 2,800 on the local system. Now, this is something that is going to be changing. There's some, some big changes coming in this area. Um, they're not quite ready for prime time yet, but probably should be something out on that towards the end of the year. So the result of that is we're going to end up probably with a lot more bridges posted, but more information will come on that at a later date. So next slide. So kind of one of the last things that we're involved in is bridge utility attachments. So there's a couple of examples down there. That's the Shoto River Bridge in Kansas City, a couple of utility examples on that bridge. Um, so as everybody's probably aware, we got utilities on our right away in a lot of areas of the state. So a lot of times on a lake crossing or a major river crossing, the utility will ask, hey, can we bring it across on your bridge? So that might be a, a telephone line. It might be a, a water a water line or a sewer line. Um, in the past, we've actually had, I think in Kansas City, there was a, a line that went across one of the bridges that had jet fuel in it. Um, that bridge has since been removed. And once they removed it, we said, you're not putting that back. So for a utility to put something on a bridge, it requires a contract agreement with MoDOT. So We've got, I've got a guy in this area that deals with that and he works very closely with the district utility engineers to put together these contracts and make sure everything's being done properly. So basically what we do is he puts, works on getting the contract together. And then this utility is saying, well, here's how we want to do it. We'll take a look at that and determine if we like the way they're going to attach. If not, well, then we'll tell them, okay, this is what we changes we want you to make. So I think that was the last slide, Brian. Yep. I'll hand it off to Travis. Thanks, Dave. I'm Travis. I'll be going over the hydraulic preliminary design section slides. Just a quick agenda. First, I'd like to introduce my preliminary sections team members. And we'll go over project lead times, basically how long it takes us to do different types of bridge projects. There'll be several slides on bridge survey requests, touching maybe 1D versus 2D surveys, um, where we survey at, or where we uh, put our location requests for those surveys at, and then where LIDAR is available at. And then after that, we'll touch on what makes a good survey or what does it look like. And a brief discussion on bridge rehabs and the rehab checklist. And we'll finish off with some uh, discussion on bridge, uh, drainage at bridge ends, and then no perch bridges. Next slide, please. I'll just introduce our team members for the preliminary section. Myself, I'm on the top left, structural hydraulic and preliminary design engineer. We also have Ken Shamit, who's the bridge location layout designer. Wayne Elliott, who's also a bridge location layout designer. Bly Nira, same bridge location layout designer. And our newer, newest member, Kylie Ruther, is also a bridge location layout designer. The bridge survey processor is unfortunately occupied at the moment. We're looking to fulfill, fulfill that soon. And then we have Dale Henderson, who was previously in my position. He's back as a thousand hire and helping us out as a senior engineering professional. Now, this group of people, they tend to, uh, they work with the majority of the preliminary work in our office. What they can't handle is give it to our plans production staff for training and to keep as much in house as we can. And if the plans production can't handle it, then that is typically shipped off to a consultant. Next slide. This slide will go over the project lead times for different types of our bridge projects. The first row, new bridges and replacement bridges, superstructure replacements and bridge widenings. Our project lead time for that is 13 months. And that's from the time we start the projects into the PS and E day. So basically when we kind of like the survey submitted by. Now that has increased for seismic or railway involvement. We'll need that 24 months. Um, railway involvement, 
Railroads just tend to be a little bit harder to work with. They have to review everything we submit to them for the projects as well. And size mix which requires extra design time. Uh, the second row deals with just kind of basic redex and basic rehabs. That lead time is 12 months. If it's if it's a complicated redeck or rehab, it probably fall into the first category, the 13 months. And then the final row, curb lockouts, safe and sound bridge and post modifications, culvert guardrail attachments, items such as that. We, nine months is kind of what we like to see. And nine months might seem like a lot for the bottom three, but this is kind of real, real filler work for our technicians. It allows them to build resource that use our resources wisely and not just cram them in at the last minute. Next slide. The chart you see here is for a new bridge design that's non-seismic and non-railroad crossing. As you can see on the chart, it takes about six to seven months just for the preliminary work to finish before we hand it off to final design. The final design is about five months, five to six months after that. This chart can be seen in the EPG 751.1. 1.5 if you'd like to see it. Next slide. The next several slides are going to touch on bridge survey requests. Next slide. So when to when to submit a bridge survey? Well, it really depends on your surveys, the district surveys uh, crew schedule and the project lead times I just previously discussed. When we receive a bridge survey location request, we try to turn that around within one week. If we receive a lot within that week, it usually take, can take longer. Um, so you really need to allow up to about four weeks before you get that back. And how, how do you submit those? You can submit them through to the bridge survey processor through ProjectWise. And there's some guidance in the EPG 747.1.1. So one one D versus two D surveys. Oh, when, when does one work over the other? How do we decide which is which? A one D surveys work well when the floodplain is narrow, the crossing is square or, or slightly skewed, up to about fifteen degrees. The structure is near the center of the floodplain. The channel and floodplain are relatively straight. There's only a single bridge opening, so no multiple multi structures in the floodplain, and the bridge. Opening carries a full discharge, so no roadway overtopping. We also had no rises required. That's not quite as much of an issue at the moment. Um, FEMA has issued more guidance for using 2Ds to do no rises. But when applicable, we try to get uh, a FEMA model if one is available. So actually, the survey is not required. Next slide. Uh, 2D models work well based on those pictures when it's a large floodplain, such as the one on the left. There's multiple structures within that same drainage area. Or to the one to the right, where there's a heavy curvature of the channel within the floodplain. Also, heavier screwed structures, or when roadway overtopping does occur, we like to use a 2D model. Now, if we aren't sure which type of model will be better when we get that bridge survey request, we will run a rough 2D model to see which one works better. And if we can get away with the, just a simple 1D model. Next slide. Now, you might ask, how do we determine where we need those channel sections and valley sections placed? Well, for a 1D survey, in general, for the first valley sections, should be outside the ineffective flow area, as pictured on the graph to the right. We tend typically assume one to one contraction for the upstream and two to one expansion on the downstream. The second downstream valley section should be sufficiently downstream that the bridge causes no effect on the water surface. This is typically one to one and a half times that first valley section is distant. Next slide.
for 2D, the LIDAR limit is again sufficiently upstream and downstream that the bridge causes no effect and that the model reaches a steady state. Uh, the stream bed profiles are typically to the limit of the LIDAR boundary. And we like to place channel sections at, at locations of higher importance, such as around bends uh, or narrow sections or especially around stream, stream junctions. Next slide. Now we do have LIDAR publicly available through most of the state. You'll find this at the Missouri Spatial Data Information Services or MISDIS. The link is provided. The map to the right shows what counties are available at MISDIS. There's also United States Interagency inter Elevation Inventory from NOAA. They're not quite as much data on that I found as uh, MISDIS. MISDIS might go to on LIDAR data. Next slide. So what does a good survey look like? Well, that really depends on the type. We have stream crossings, 1D survey, 2D survey, grade separations, railroad crossings, retain walls, MSE walls. Those all can look a little bit different. Each one requires something slightly different. I won't necessarily have a three line profile with a grade separation like I do for a stream crossing. So your best bet is to follow the guidance in EPG 747. From there, you can go to the bridge survey checklist, which is shown on the right. And for stream crossings, also follow the guidance dictated in the bridge survey request. Next slide. So next we'll be talking about bridge rehabs. A good portion of our work is actually the rehabilitation of existing bridges. And that all starts with a good and complete checklist. Next slide. The structural checklist can be found there as well with the link. Um, so when do you submit this to the bridge division? The answer is the sooner the better. You really should refer to the project lead time for that. Rehabs and redex really is 24 months or 24, 12 months prior to the PSNE. Curb lockouts, guardrail attachments, simple overlays, those about nine months prior to the PSNE. Who should complete these checklists? At the least, the district bridge engineer, but also the transportation project manager. You may include the transportation project designer or the structural project manager or others as you wish. Next slide. I'd just like briefly touch on drainage at bridge ends. Next slide. What is bridge and drainage? Well, it's an EPG 748.7. This is the means to convey bridge deck and roadway discharge away from the bridge end so it doesn't erode our exposed slopes and side slopes. Examples of that can be concrete exposed slope protection, Concrete slope aprons, drainage basins, curbs, rock blankets, drain, flume, drain flumes, etc. When do you use these? Well, they really should be considered on every bridge job, not just new bridges. They should be done on considered on redex or rehab bridges as well. Um, examples of when you should use them: so downgrade ends of slope bridges, bridges in the sag vertical curve, long and wide bridges. Inside radius is super elevated and curved bridges, roadways with curve and gutters leading up to the bridge ends. Basically, anything that's going to see a lot of water on it. <laughs> now, generally, these are considered roadway items, but if you're unsure, you should really coordinate with the bridge division. Next slide. So, no perch bridges. Well, as you can see from this, there's a bridge in the middle and the stream and the you can't get to it. There's, the roadway is covered. So there's really no point of building a bridge that you can't reach. Next slide. So 
And for new alignments, the direction is really no proof bridges. For the existing alignments, you should evaluate the corridor on a case by case basis. You know, see if it's sufficient ADT to consider grade and raise to remove that type of bridge bridges. And we should avoid bridge bridges whenever possible. And that does it for my slides. In the next section, I'll turn over to David Hagmeyer for plans production. Thanks. All right, thank you, Travis. So, um, as Travis shared, I'm going to talk about the plans production section and so um, share a little bit about my team and, and what we do. Next slide, Brian. So the plans production is a, is a team of 32 engineers, designers and technicians, and um, we, uh, we take care of all the bridges um, that we do in house, the department does. That's what our team works on. Um, we've got four structural project managers, and that's Anison Arompradith, uh, Joe Alderson, um, Ted Kester, and Tim Leaf. And most of the time, um, the districts you'll be working with these individuals, um, that's who you'll be in contact with most of the time. Um, my team also uh, consists of two senior structural engineers. Um, these gentlemen are they train and mentor our new designers and they handle our complex projects. And here's one for each floor um, for the bridge division. Uh, we're on two floors, um, third and fourth in the central office. And so uh, we have them strategically located so that they can be available to all of our um, staff. Um, we have a total of 15 structural designers um, on this team. And we've got two structural specialists. These are um, our top um, structural uh, detailers. They train and mentor our new technicians and they handle complex projects. And again, we have them set up as one each floor um, to be available to all of our technicians that we have spread out on both floors. Um, we've also got eight structural technicians and um, you know, they work hand in hand with our engineers to make sure that we get those plans put together. So, um, in the last two years, um, we've actually hired on 15 new designers and technicians onto the plans production team. So, uh, and even with that many people coming onto our team, um, we still have vacancies. And so we're a fairly young team. Um, so, just a little bit about our team. In addition to that, um, three of our four structural project managers uh, have been in their roles for two years or less. Next slide. So what do we do? Um, well, um, our team puts together the structural computations uh, necessary for designing new bridges, um, the, the same computations that support complex rehabs, widenings of structures, and uh, all changes to existing structures. Um, also, uh, we develop the plans, the structural plans um, that are supported by those design computations to, to guide the construction of all types of our bridge projects. Uh, this includes new and replacement bridges, uh, complex rehabilitations, uh, such as superstructure replacements and widening of existing structures, redecking of existing structures, Minor rehabilitations such as overlays or joint replacements. Um, some of my staff would disagree that, you know, they'd probably say that some of those joint replacements are rather complex and they can be. Um, and then also we have, we do uh, curb blockouts, in post modifications, and attaching of driving guardrail. In addition, as Travis mentioned earlier, we also serve as an overflow for our preliminary team. And we do this for a couple of reasons. Um, it helps to develop our staff so that we have people that are ready to step into that preliminary design role when a vacancy arises. It also helps to maximize what work we're able to keep in house. Next slide. So how is it that we do our work? Well, once the preliminary design is complete, uh, the project is handed off um, 
from Travis's team to my team. In the plans production, uh, we'll go through the following steps. Um, we will do a final design. That design will be checked, um, and that's a full design prompt. Um, then those, uh, once the design's been checked, um, we'll have a technician start detailing the plans. The plans will then be checked to ensure that um, they line up with the, um, the design computations. And then the SPM or structural project manager will review the plans and the design comps to make sure uh, that, that nothing has been missed. Um, the final design projects require teams of anywhere from two to four staff members, depending on the size of the project. And so uh, I've got a listing there, uh, new replacement bridges, typically those are a team of four, and that's a mix of designers and detailers. Um, complex bridge rehabilitations, um, those would take a team of four. Uh, with redecks and existing structures, depending on how complex the redeck is, it would be a team of either three or four. Minor bridge rehabilitations, such as overlays and joint replacements, are typically just a team of three. Curb blockouts, in post modifications, and uh, attaching thriving guardrail, typically teams of two and sometimes three. Next. So, when do we start? So, as Travis shared earlier, um, work on bridge projects cannot start until our office has received either a completed bridge survey or a completed structural rehabilitation checklist. Um, and I want to stress that the preliminary design work, it doesn't start right when they receive, uh, until they receive a completed survey. So, if the survey comes to us and it's incomplete, or if there's a significant number of errors, uh, the preliminary design can't be started. And so that two months that's allotted for, it's actually more than just two months, but that time that's allotted for Travis's team to work on preliminary, it's for their staff to do the layout. So, um, and if they get it late or they have to spend a significant amount of time um, getting the survey to be usable, um, then that just delays um, when our team, the plans production team is able to start. Um, final design staff, uh, from our plans production team, they are not assigned until uh, the bridge memorandum has been completed by our prim preliminary staff and it's been reviewed and signed by the district. For smaller rehab projects, such as curb blockouts and um, attaching guardrail, the structural project manager uh, may elect to draft an agreement um, in an email with the district as opposed to going with a full blown bridge memorandum. Um, if he has the time, um, th then we would do that. But sometimes um, if it's cutting a little close, we'll go that route. Next slide, please. So what is the bridge memorandum? Um, so the bridge memorandum, this is this document that our preliminary staff put together um, based on the bridge rehabilitation checklist, the bridge survey data, um, that we receive from the districts, and it's supported by their analysis and their computations of what type of what the structure is going to look like. Um, and so this just this document would inform everyone of where the bridge location is, uh, the kind of structure, the type of work that's going to be done, whether it's rehab or replacement, um, cost estimate, and any other pertinent information to guide. Um, not just the district's uh, team as they prepare roadway plans, but also my team as they prepare the final bridge plans. So within this document, we will do our best to call out the areas that are roadway items. And so, for example, um, when we have a road, you know, rock blanket for new bridges is a roadway item, and we'll try to specify that um, and let them know what distance along the spill slope for the roadway people to be able to put that on their plans. And so other items that can be better for roadway use, for example, is a cost estimate used for budgeting and all plan work um, is accounted for in this document. Next. So why is this document necessary? So 
Um, this document helps make sure that the bridge division and the district are on the same page and make sure that we can de we can deliver the project um, that the that the traveling public needs. Um, is uh, this max we by using these um, bridge memorandums it maximizes the number of projects that we can deliver for our districts. The reason this agreement does that is because it helps us minimize the possibility of rework on the design computations and on final plans. Um, this also ensures that the bridge plans aligns with uh, the roadway plans and inches matter. Um, when it comes to steel structures, these are often detailed. Um, some aspects of them have to be detailed to a 16th of an inch. Um, concrete cambering and haunching is typically detailed to an eighth of an inch. So we have to know um, where that structure is located. We have to know that it's in the right spot. We've got to know that the profile grade's not gonna change. And so this document ensures that uh, once it's signed and reviewed um, by the district that this is the direction we're going. And um, you know, that way we know that um, the amount of work that uh, my team has to put into uh, for these computations that this, uh, they're going to be able to get this done and not have to do a significant amount of rework. Um, changes in these uh, items and other items can cause significant amounts of rework and delays um, in meeting the uh, project turning dates. So, so changes required. Obviously, sometimes it's unavoidable. So if there is a change, so if the district um, in looking at it sees that there was a bust or just sees there's another concern that comes up that requires a change. We need that to be communicated with us as soon as possible. Um, the earlier the change is com communicated, uh, the greater our ability is to accommodate that change and still meet the target deadline. Um, so things can be changed, but it must be communicated. Um, if the communication comes, for example, a few months prior to turn in of a new bridge, however, that would be too late. Um, and so, uh, you know, that would, we'd have to be accommodated to be able to, uh, if the change is significant, if we have to do a redesign, we'd have to be accommodated that time. Next slide. All right, so who to contact within plans production? So early in the project, we're talking three to five years out um, for STIP. Um, the, the project contacts um, would be the structural liaison uh, engineer and the structural project manager. Uh, if you're contacting and reaching out to them by email, uh, please copy myself, the structural resource manager, and Travis, the structural hydraulic preliminary design engineer. That way we can kind of uh, be in the loop. Um, but uh, as you can see, we've got a map on here that in this map is on our bridge SharePoint site. And what we've done is we have uh, divvied up uh, the state and assigned all the counties in the state uh, to SPMs. And as you can see, there's also district uh, assignments for structural liaisons. And so if you have a project in a particular county, that would be a, your good, a good place to start, which is contacting the structural liaison of that of your district and the structural project manager of the county that it, that's of the account assigned county. Um, if it's one to three years out on the project related um, in the in the inquiry is project related about one you would contact either the structural liaison or the project manager. Uh, hopefully by then we would have it defined as whether it's an in-house project or a consultant project. Um, that way you would know who your contact is. Um, for any bridge survey and requests and hydraulic questions, um, the structural hydraulic preliminary designer, uh, Travis Stump, um, who takes those questions. And um, so one of the things that we do, um, the structural project managers, um, the structural hydraulic engineer and myself, we need quarterly to evaluate and discuss changes in our resources and project timelines to be as proactive as possible in determining the status of all projects and whether any should go out to consult. So if you do have questions, um, again, uh, this is um, there on the SharePoint for who to contact. 
Next. Okay, so does my paving project need any bridge resources? Um, so when are curb blockouts and in post um, modifications or guard, when are those things needed? Um, in the past, transportation planning used to create maps that showed what bridges and structures were within the limits of the paving projects. Um, right now, if you have a, if you have a uh, resurfacing project, um, if you needed to determine the structures that were on it, uh, you can go to the TMS site and they have a tool in the data zone, which allows you to put in the limits of your paving project um, and it will give you uh, the bridges that are along that uh, route within the limits of your project. And so you can then reach out to your district bridge engineer and your assigned structural liaison to start determining which of these structures will need to have work done on them and which structures should be or can be exempted. Um, again, if a bridge falls within the project limits, um, it must be evaluated to see if it meets current safety standards. And if the project is being done with federal funds, any substandard safety item must be remedied or handled by a design exception. And so when you're, this is a good tool to make sure you've not missed any of the structures uh, that are in that limits. And so that way you can be uh, proactive in reaching out to your district bridge engineer structural liaison to see which course um, of action you have to, to deal with those structures. Next. So the most common improvement treatment um, to barriers that we have that, that, um, that get triggered uh, whenever there's a paving project or an overlay is curb blockouts. Next. So when are curb blockouts necessary? Um, I will try to give a quick rundown on this, but the best place to go is EPG 751.1.3.4. Uh, and it goes through, there's a, there's a lot of different barriers um, that we use on our bridges or have been used through the history of um, our state. And so that gives you uh, more information, but real quick, some of the common ones that we see that need to have curb blockouts um, would be our curb and parapet barriers. And so when you have these, uh, typically um, any real adjustment on the uh, grade is going to trigger most often um, the need for a curb blockout. Um, the other thing to be looking at when you're determining whether you need a curb blockout is to, you should be reviewing your accident history. Um, if there's been an accident striking a curb, uh, an upgrade is required. Um, so if both your accident history and your grade requirements of the existing barriers are not met, then it shall be necessary to upgrade uh, the curb and parapet with a curb blockout. Next. So, um, when, when are design exceptions allowed? Um, so if you don't meet, uh, if you are adjusting the grade and there's, you have issues with that, or you have some accident history, um, these are some of the other criteria that you would have to meet in order to get a design exception. So, um, if it is a non NA NHS route with less. AADT less than 1700 and you have no accident history and your grade raise is going to be less than two inches from the 27, um, then it would be eligible for um, doing a design exception. Um, in addition, if the structure in question is planned to be replaced or redecked in the near future, so it's already in the STIP um, or going to be added in the next cycle, um, then those would be eligible um, for design exception. And, you know, because obviously if we're replacing the bridge, we'll be taking care of that safety deficiency um, and it's scheduled uh, and to be hopefully handled shortly. Again, more information and more depth on this um, can be in EPG 
0.1, 0.3, 0.4. Next. So uh, one of the things that our plans production team has been working on um, is uh, we have been working on doing standard designs for single span bridges uh, since late 2017. And so where are we at on this? So um, a little bit of background about what what we're trying to accomplish here. Uh, we're looking at standardizing single span bridges for span ranges from 40 feet to 120. We're setting them up in five foot increments with four roadway widths. Um, there are five uh, options when it comes to superstructure type. So we've got spread box beams, I girders, in U girders, uh, wide flange beams and plate girders. And so we have been working on this over four summers. We've had six interns um, helping us with this uh, and they've been mentored by two designers. And so, so far, we're getting close to completing uh, the design aspect of this. We have completed 344 of the 360 designs that we have needed for these options. Uh, we have 200 of those 344 designs that have actually been checked um, and are available to be used by our staff um, to help us with speeding our design time when we have a single span. So, once all these designs are completed by our interns and have been checked by our designers, we are hoping to move forward with standard plans um, to, to have standard plans for these. So uh, I just want to send a little thanks to the interns who have been working on this. Uh, Katie Kramer, uh, Ryan Sullivan, uh, Helen Temporal, Justin Beckmeyer, Jordan Creamer, and Nicholas Yonke. So, um, if you see any of those guys or gals, uh, let them know um, how much their work is appreciated. So, and with that, I'm going to turn this over to Trent in the review section. Hello, my name is Trent Crawford and I'm a senior structural engineer and I'm here to present to you uh, what we do in review section. So, our section consists of Dan Smith, the structural review engineer, uh, myself, Gabe Schubert, structural analyst, and Aaron Hoff Hoffman, who is also a structural analyst. And our job, uh, our job uh, begins after plans production is done, basically checking the plans, uh, and the project manager is comfortable with them. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, the overview of our tasks are plans review, uh, working day studies, estimates and pricing, asset management, uh, bridge special provisions, critiquing bids and what or critiquing bids received. And one I didn't add on there was uh, bridge electronic deliverables. I didn't add that one on there because there's really not too much to it. It is very necessary though uh, that the uh, contractors get that that stuff involved, which has in it the existing bridge plans and uh, the uh, lead-based paint and asbestos report and the geotechnical report, if there is a geotechnical technical report. So basically we help put together the uh, bridge bid package. So that is uh, basically the plans review again, the working day study estimate and uh, uh, the bridge special provisions. Um, next slide, please. So for plans review, what, uh, what I'm typically looking at, uh, is, uh, we try to assess on the bridge plans. If there are any issues with constructability, maybe say they put a lap in the wrong section of, if you have a column to drill shaft, uh, connection and they put the. The lap may be in the drill shaft instead of the column. I'm going to point that out and I'm going to say, hey, we probably need to, for constructability, we probably need to put that up in the, in the column. Um, or if there may be clear cover issues, maybe they're using uh, uh, mechanical bar splices and uh, that, that reduces to co the uh, cover of the bar because it will increase the width. So 
uh, that will reduce the clear cover and maybe that's uh, beyond tolerance and we, we don't want that. So I'll be checking stuff like that. I'll also be checking to make sure that uh, all the materials and services rendered is paid for and called out in either the plans or the job special provisions. Um, also, we'll be spot checking uh, various quantities. Uh, I usually will spot check maybe the Class B concrete uh, and uh, uh, pretty basic spot checks. Maybe uh, if we're uh, removing a strip seal, we'll I'll calculate that. It's basically just the inside of barrier to inside of barrier uh, distance uh, along the skew. So that one's relatively easy to check and, and quick, uh, or the square footage of deck for maybe a redeck or a, uh, a slab on steel or slab on concrete uh, quantity. Uh, and we'll check for missing details and notes. So uh, in a lot of our sections, we'll look for maybe uh, two views of the uh, uh, steel. So if We've got a plan view. We've got a uh, elevation view of steel. Uh, we'll we'll need to show the bars in there, or we like to show the bars in there twice. So if they do, if I see that a bar is missing in in one of the views, maybe you need another cross section. Sometimes the cross sections get turned around, and and we have to tell them, you know, we we need to flip this uh, uh, back the other way because the section arrows are facing the other direction. So. It's, it's that kind of stuff that we're looking for on bridge plans. Um, next slide, please. Working day study is also something that we're that we look into uh, in depth, or we'll we'll uh, create uh, for a job. And basically, uh, you're just trying to find a critical path. So. Uh, that a lot of what goes into that is uh, thinking about what work is going to be performed simultaneously and which which of that work is going to take the longest um and and just uh the order of operations of and, and what what can happen uh what has to happen before something else happens and uh a lot of this uh when it comes to uh, uh calculating the work spent we have production rates that we've developed over the years uh, basically, it's work per time rates, uh, and and uh, that helps us uh, uh, choose the critical path. Uh, an example of that would be like uh, to to pour the safety barrier curve. We'll estimate that it, it's usually 300 linear feet per day, or maybe if we're doing a slab on concrete estimate uh, working days, we'll we'll estimate the deck panels will be about 800 square feet a day to, to place those and, and, the form, and to form the overhangs, it's gonna be 120 square feet a day. But these are all uh, rates that we've developed over the years. Um, next slide, please. Um, and uh, a large part of what we do is estimates and price tracking, estimates, uh, estimate considerations, uh, uh, are uh, th these will drive up the cost. These staged, curved, traffic count, crossing type will all, uh, if, if the crossing is a major river bridge, the traffic count is high, all these things will, will increase costs. Seismic regions will usually consider more in the preliminary stages probably because uh, you might have uh, different kinds of, of uh, uh, reinforcement going on there. So we'll increase the cost a little bit in the preliminary region or in the preliminary stage. Uh, if there's night work, that will increase the cost. And uh, obviously, if you have a small quantity of something, it's, it's usually going to be at a premium. Uh, for instance, uh, class B1 concrete is uh, for less than 100 cubic yards of that you'll you'll it'll run you about thirteen hundred uh, dollars a cubic yard, whereas if you have greater than a hundred cubic yards, uh, it'll run you about eight hundred and fifty dollars a cubic yard. Uh, the 
the program we, we use to uh, do our estimates is bid tabs, which provides us a history of bids uh, for any particular item. Um, and the nice thing about it is it allows us to filter uh, by region, by quantity, uh, by ranking of bidders. So we can take the uh, low bidder only, or we can take the low two bidders or uh, anything like that. Uh, it also, this, this program, we also actually uh, input and keep our bids in through uh, the uh, bid tabs plus. Uh, and uh, it's it's a very uh, integral part of how we make our estimates in, in this program. Next slide, please. So on to the price tracking of this. Uh, when uh, this is primarily uh, a a something we provide for. Uh, the preliminary section, uh, because it, it makes in the in the preliminary stages, you don't necessarily have an exact quantity that you're predicting, or uh, you don't exactly uh, uh, have everything nailed down. Whereas uh, in the review stage, you know all that stuff, and you can use bid tabs, and you can you can. Uh, you can figure out by quantity how much uh, uh, things are going to cost based on historically what it's cost. So, but in the preliminary, uh, it's it's more of a generalized uh, estimate, and it, uh, it's also broken down into uh, different categories. Uh, for instance, like our conduit systems are broken down into uh, different diameters of conduit system. Um, and our uh, protective coating uh, on concrete vents and piers, uh, if you notice, that's a lump sum. Well, uh, if we're price tracking uh, this, we're going to have to actually break that lump sum, lump sum out into a square foot. So in doing that, I have created several spreadsheets to uh, and one of those is is shown right there uh, as to how I actually go about that there. I basically will look in uh, uh, individual uh, bridge uh, quantities and pull that estimated square foot if it's provided out and, and input it, and then I'll get a weighted average cost of, of that item. And we have to do that for uh, all of our lump sum items, uh, go through individual plans to find all these various uh, links and quantities to, to fulfill uh, uh, that requirement. So anyway, uh, on to uh, the next slide, please. So uh, we're also in, in charge of uh, asset management. Uh, so once bids are received, uh, we calculate uh, this asset management number uh, by the following equation. It's the total project cost from the low bidder over the existing bridge deck, bleh, bridge deck area. Uh, this data is used as a guide by districts to program the right amount of bridge work to keep the system in good condition when programming uh, projects into the five year step. And we only do this uh, uh, for jobs that are that include new bridges, superstructure replacements and redex. Uh, I believe there's a different. Uh, uh, there's a. a, a, a different uh, equation possibly that the district uses for uh, 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 for rehabs. So anyway, on to the next slide, please. And we also will uh, uh, put together the bridge special provision. So basically any work uh, needing additional instruction not provided in this uh, Missouri standard specification will be written in the special or bridge special provisions. Uh, 
and uh, we don't necessarily write from scratch. Most of the bridge special provisions will have been written, but only need to be modified uh, to comply with the job. So uh, at minimum, this uh, will include a description of work, construction requirements, uh, materials, method of measurement, and basis of payment. Um, so once we have decided that a bridge special provision is gonna be used uh, basically in continuum, it, it will be placed eventually in uh, the Missouri standard specifications, and then we'll no longer have to put the BSP in with the uh, bridge special provisions or that specific job uh, work required BSP into the job special provisions. So, um, next slide, please. Okay, and uh, finally, uh, we will critique uh, bids received. So, uh, jobs in which contractors have bid on are broken into sections. Some are roadway sections, some are bridge. Uh, if a bridge section was uh, bid over or under 10%, then we will take a deeper look into uh, what basically caused that. So, we'll look into each pay item to determine which items have caused the estimate to be off. And if we can justify the bid being what it is, if we can't justify it, then uh, uh, well, we might have to uh, decide whether or not. Uh, uh, well, we pass that on to design, and ultimately they would be deciding on whether or not. Well, uh, whether or not this would be awarded, that that would come into. Uh, the conversation. So uh, this also helps us to refine our bids uh, to identify possible market trends. Maybe, uh, for instance, the price of steel has been going up at a steep rise or other factors possibly driving the cost, such as uh, uh, maybe there is bridge accessibility issues. Uh, maybe uh, there there was a time when we had issues getting uh, aggregate on site because we had a trucking so shortage. So uh, that uh, uh, drove bids up and we weren't matching uh, what they had. And well, that, that uh, came to be the reason. So anyway, uh, that's my short spiel on, on the review section. Um, now I'll kick this back over to Brian. Okay, thank you, everybody. I'm going to go over the last two sections of our division uh, very quickly. They are equally important. And so we'll start off with the fabrication section. Uh, Dean Frankie, many of you probably dealt with him, is our fabrication operations engineer. And he has three fabrication inspectors, two of them are senior level and uh, Mark Sidebottom is the newest addition to the fabrication section as a fabrication inspector. So these, this group of people, and I've put their uh, email address down there. If you have uh, shop drawings that need to be submitted to the, the, to the bridge division, if you use this fabrication shop drawing submittal email address, uh, all the people that need to get this information will get it. And it'll also, if somebody's on vacation or something like that, it won't sit around in an in a inbox waiting for action. So uh, what did the fabrication section do? Okay, they, they check shop drawings for steel and pre-stressed concrete bridges, and they provide on-site quality assurance inspections at steel fabrication plants throughout the U.S. Uh, we have we have a plant here in Jefferson City, and and they have an associated shop in Sedalia as well. It's DeLong's Inc. But our people have traveled uh, to Arkansas, Wisconsin, Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and numerous other places to inspect the steel fabrication as it takes place in the shop. 
we don't, um, you know, the contractor selects who's doing the fabrication. So we have to travel to where the, where that fabrication takes place. So if you need to deal with our fabrication section, uh, those individuals or that uh, shop drawing submittal email is the appropriate location to do that. And the next important area of the bridge division is the development section. Um, the, they're kind of behind the scenes people. And uh, we have Darren Kimna, structural development and support engineer, Suresh Patel, senior structural engineer, Boyd Denson, senior structural designer, and Debbie Beckwith, structural specialist. So the development section is the ones that maintain our engineering policy guide. They're the ones that also help us remain current with the AASHTO codes related to structural design. I show a picture here of the LRFD bridge design specifications. Uh, each year, the AASHTO Committee on Bridges and Structures gets together. Uh, it's all the state bridge engineers, all 50 of them, plus a bunch of federal highway people and all, and discuss ballot items. So every year, there are changes to these codes that all 50 state bridge engineers uh, vote on. And there are 20 different technical committees uh, related to the AASHTO Committee on Bridges and Structures. So, uh, for example, T14 is the steel, steel bridge uh, committee. T10 is the uh, concrete bridge committee. T3 is the seismic design committee. And, and we have the... Um, Bridge Management Committees T18 and guardrails and all these other things. So our development section takes all those ballot items, uh, reviews them each year, makes recommendations on uh, does Missouri support these ballot items? Do we oppose these ballot items? And gives us recommendations on how we vote. Uh, as I mentioned, they maintain bridge related parts of the engineering policy guide and uh, Boyd and Suresh and Darren are all, uh, and, and Debbie is all involved in, in updating that. We get it over to the design division if it needs balloting and, and so on. And then uh, on a side note, they also evaluate uh, bridge design software that we might use in-house for our plans production people or our rating, uh, load rating uh, program. So very important group of people there as well. So um, we're going to end this uh, with uh, a little bit of time left over for question and answers. But uh, Travis had a quote here. What better job in all the world than build a bridge, bring land over water, bring worlds together. So uh, with that, I'm going to put the last slide up there. If you need to contact us, I'm going to leave this up here and we're going to talk and answer any questions that you may have. So. I want to thank all of our pre presenters uh, for the great presentations. And at this time, we're taking questions. Uh, if you haven't, if you've been paying attention, we did have one question in the chat pod there, or the the question and answer pod, and we're gonna we're gonna read that right now, and then we'll go on to open the floor for verbal questions. And so, if you use the raise your hand tool in the in the WebEx and the participants uh, window there. Uh, Charlotte will unmute you and we can verbally answer those questions. But so the, the question that's in the uh, chat pod there uh, is, does the curb blockouts take into account the taller MGS guardrail height requirements? I have a few issues with trying to fix guardrail hits on safe and sound bridges with the shorter walls they have. And we are aware that this is an issue. And so what we did do was develop uh, in post modification standard details that we use for safe and sound bridge rails to attach the uh, MGS guardrail to these bridges. So essentially what we do is take off uh, five to six feet of the shorter rail, uh, add a taller in post there, taper it down to the bridge rail height on the bridge itself, and that allows the the uh, roadway uh, guardrail attachment to the bridge. Uh, so that is how we've been dealing with that. The typically those um, 
Station Sound bridge rails are 29 inches. They're not the 31 inches, but we address that at the end so you can attach the higher guardrail. And I'm alerted that there are additional questions there. So during plans review, what's the most common mistake? And uh, Travis said, I would say sizing the barrier curb steel on the wings for non integral invents. Do, do any of our um, other uh, presenters want to take a stab at that one? Trent, do you have any? Well, that, that was my input on it. Uh, okay. I've, I've caught a lot of uh, different links uh, for barrier curb steel in the, because, you know, the, the wing doesn't set flush to the slab. It actually sets kind of sometimes above uh, the top of back wall. So it's kind of, it's kind of a funky detail. Okay. Thank you, Trent. Um, Georgine asked, what kind of failure happened to the bridge in Osage County? And uh, David answered this one, and I, I think we're talking about the uh, the old truss bridge that was on a local route uh, just outside of Westphalia. It says, I assume that you're talking about the local system old truss bridge. It was posted for a load load capacity, and a semi tried to cross it, resulting in collapse of the bridge. Uh, the roadway, if if we are indeed talking about this particular bridge, the roadway up to that bridge basically has a 90 degree curve. And uh, I don't know if uh, Google or whatever sent this truck driver down that road, but he was essentially in a fish trap and I don't think he could could have backed up or he maybe wasn't felt confident in doing that. So he tried to cross the bridge and uh, as soon as he got the semi on there, uh, the bridge went into the water. So let's see, Randy's got a question here. What is the difference between a viaduct and a bridge? Uh, I, I guess uh, anybody got an answer for that? So, good question, Randy. I'm not sure. I mean, a viaduct is a bridge. Right. <laughs> Usually, <laughs> a viaduct's a bigger, a bigger bridge, a long bridge, you know, spanning over, like a, you know, a bottom area in a big town, like we got the ones coming in from. Kansas and the Kansas City and stuff. So I don't know if we really have a good answer for that. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking of uh, br bridges in St. Louis that are long bridges over a bunch of roadways and things like that as well. Ah, Mark Corcoran, can you share any more on the load postings that are coming? David, I want to, I know you alluded to that and we haven't presented this to the executives, so it's, it's kind of secret, but um, can you, can you share any additional information or why, well, why do we have to do this? I guess is probably the better point. We're going to post every bridge in the Southeast district at 5 tons. So. <laughs> That's uh, not true. We basically have, you know, I talked about federal highway does a review of our inspection program every year well that includes load rating mbi stuff so they did a review of our load rating stuff and po that includes postings um i think it was three years ago for forget the exact year so they found issues with it it wasn't surprised we knew there were things there that we needed to work on so one of those was you know our posting policy dated back to the 80s so if you think about the dump trucks and stuff that were running around the 80s they were typically a three axle vehicle and now you see five, six, and seven axle ones running around. And those things can get up in, you know, the seven axle ones, they can be actually over 70,000 pounds. And then on the semi side of thing, we have special exceptions for grain haulers can go 10% over during harvest season. The cattle trucks can go up to 85,500. And there's all these different exceptions. So our, the, the law changes and stuff were way beyond our posting practices which were 40 years old so we had to go through and do a study and we've updated our posting practices so essentially what's what's coming once it gets final approval is we we post at 23 tons for a single unit vehicle now that's going to go up to 30 tons and then a semi is going to go from 40 tons to 45 tons so obviously that's going to have a pretty big impact as we start working on, on that and uh the last thing we got to do uh, is work with Federal Highway has come up with a plan of how we're going to do that. And that's a huge task 
uh, when you got to go and review stuff on 24,000 bridges. So it's going to be, it's coming, but once we started, it's going to be kind of slowly coming. All right, thank you, David. So um, you probably saw uh, Jessica alerted that I was uh, showing some uh, Google search there. So the main difference between, I did a Google search, the main difference between bridge and viaduct is that a bridge is a structure to built to span obstacles and a viaduct is a type of bridge crossing a valley or a gorge. So David's answer there was uh, uh, pretty, pretty good. So anyhow, let's see, what else do we have? Kenny Voss, what is the most common issue that delays bridge design? I'm going to let either David Hagemeyer or Travis talk about that. I'll jump in here first. Uh, so I guess uh, traditionally or currently, uh, so traditionally, I think, and Travis will probably echo this, is getting the bridge survey in timely uh, in, in, in a timely manner and it being complete so that we can actually have preliminary start in a on time as well as then our staff being able to follow preliminary when they're able to get done. Uh, currently, it's resources. Um, right now, uh, I'm down half my technician staff. Um, so I have five technicians approximately as opposed to 10. So uh, that is slowing our bridge design, the ability to be able to detail the plan. So, um, but that would be a hopefully a pick up and something that we can get fixed in the future so that we can get back to delivering things on time. I'll, I'll echo what David said. It's tra traditionally it's the getting the bridge survey and but also the bridge rehab checklist in as well and that that completed. And then right now also kind of really the experience of the employees we have. We have a lot of younger staff, so just trying to get them up to speed. Okay, so we have another question here. What caused the failure in KC in the three trails interchange? Anybody aware of that one? I think that's, uh, I think they're talking about where 470, 670, all those come together. Uh, Grandview Triangle, I believe that's what they might be referring to. We had to bridge there. I think it was an abutment. I think we had some type of a shear failure in the soil uh, that caused problems. I think there might have been an embassy wall there as well. So it, it was soil related, as I remember. Okay. Kenny Voss, it looks like he chimed in water <laughs> uh, for that. I think he was uh, assuming that question or answering that question. Uh, Kenny also has another when and how do we decide to move a major bridge to the stip? So we have, I'll, I'll take this one. We have a major bridge spreadsheet that we keep track of and our liaisons work with the districts to uh, decide what uh, either rehab, uh, replacement, whatever is necessary. And we Keep that in the spreadsheet and now, as, as many of you might know, the major bridge uh, comes off the top of the construction program. So the poor rural districts do not have to come up with hundreds of millions of dollars to place replace a major river crossing out of their small uh, stip allocation. So. That's how we keep track of it. Our structural liaison engineers uh, keep up with the districts on those major bridge needs and we get those programmed. We do share a number of major bridges with other states and we have uh, generally we meet yearly with those. Uh, we're meeting with Illinois in October to talk about all the bridges that we share with Illinois and we talk about what what money needs to be programmed to, uh, so we do have a couple of replacements coming up, the uh, Chain of Rocks Bridge, which is I-270 in St. Louis. And we're talking about the Chester Bridge in uh, Perry County, Illinois to Chester, uh, Illinois, is being major bridges that we're gonna be replacing. 
uh, and those come off of the top of the stiff. Okay, so the, every time a new question comes, they that goes to the bottom and everything else scrolls up. So we're getting down here. Um, Tim Pickett, are there any technologies being considered to help with estimating bridge deck repairs when they are covered? Uh, Tim, this is, I'll take this one too. And I guess if Trent wants to to chime in here, he can. But um, this is a this is a issue when we try to estimate bridge deck repairs. You know, the old technology is to go out there with a chain drag and sound the bridge. Uh, there are and we have in the past uh, hired companies that use either ground penetrating radar or some other technologies. One is being developed at the University of Missouri at Columbia by Dr. Glenn Washer, where they use an infrared camera to take pictures of the bridge deck throughout the day. And based on the infrared images, they can see which areas cool faster than others. And if, if you have a delamination in the deck at the rebar level, it's a thinner section of concrete. And so that will heat up and it will cool faster than a full eight inch deck or an eight and a half inch deck. Uh, and so they have a way to use those infrared um, pictures and determine the rate of change of the temperature of the deck. And they can estimate areas of delamination by that methodology. So there are some technologies. What, what the problem is, is we either have to contract out for those services and we have to do it um, far enough in advance uh, as the previous presenters mentioned about when does a rehab checklist need to be in and all of that. So um, we have to have that information uh, well in advance to uh, get that in the memo and get it estimated on the plans and get it estimated in the STIP, quite frankly, uh, so those, you know, you would typically have to do those um, 18 months in advance so that you can get the right amount programmed in the STIP. So uh, there are technologies, uh, but it's, uh, it's you got to have a lot of advanced planning for that. Um, let's see. Brian Berger from Kansas City. Uh, he said, that's correct, water and MSE had a global failure on the 470, 435 job. That was 10 years ago. So um, any other questions that we may answer? Uh, if you wanna ask verbally, you can raise your hand or type it in the, in the, uh, in the Q and A pod. Well, I'll, uh, I'll start the concluding remarks. If there are any other questions that come in at that time, we can address them, but let's just, uh, uh, we've included the contact information for each of the presenters here on this last slide. If we didn't get to your questions on this topic today, please reach out to any of the presenters uh, or Dean or Darren of the fabrication and development section. I hope today's presentation provided a better understanding of what the bridge division does for our customers and the districts and uh, motor carrier services. Thank you for participating in today's webinar and we appreciate any feedback on how we can improve this format or content for future webinars. Uh, I know, as I mentioned before, and Kenny has told you in the past these, uh, webinars we'd like to do a monthly if there's some topics you want us to go further in depth or something like that we could probably get on a schedule if necessary as we wrap up this webinar we'll be registering your participation in mo.u the webex system allows us to track who's attending by computer but we do not know who may be attending as part of a group or by call in if you are in attendance but not signed into webex please contact jessica gobin by email or phone at 573-751-2876 so that we can give you credit for today's training. I'm looking right now and uh, at the max, we had 129 attendees. Right now there's 100 and, uh, 112 attendees. So quite a good turnout and we appreciate everybody's time listening to us. 
And uh, lastly, I want to remind everyone that our next webinar is on the Clean Water Act 404-401 permitting and 408 permissions. It is scheduled for September 14th, 2021 from 1215 to 2.30. Please register in Mo.U for this webinar if you're interested in attending. And I don't see any further questions um, in the chat. Yes, there are, so I'm sorry. There is no hands raised. Uh, thank you, Charlotte. Uh, so this concludes our presentation for today. And I thank everyone for your participation and our presenters for doing a great job. Goodbye. <laughs>